Uh, today we're talking about a living Trouwen. You might be familiar. Um, yeah, a uh, Belgian artist from Belgium, currently living in Berlin, as far as I know. Um, That'd be a cool place to live. Berlin? Yeah. Yeah, I know it's, I've heard nothing but good things, honestly. It sounds like a really cool place to be if you're a creative person. We should go comics people on the road to Berlin. Do you want to take a road trip? A, yeah. A sky trip? Like a Conan O'Brien kind of. Trip. Yeah. Um, so I had, read, I had read this previously, but what was funny is that my first interaction with Shrowen's work, the Sunday series, was this. I had just gotten this out of order. Oh. I just picked it up and was like, oh, I'll try it, right? And then when Austin got them all back in, I think I ordered all of them. Cool. Um, but I had read this previously, but then I just read it again, all of it today. Yeah, I read it yesterday and today. So we just did a reread of the of this whole thing. Now, this came out over the course of two years, I think, right? 2019, three years, four mm. years. I think the final final one came out in 2023. Yeah, because he definitely talks about in the intro to one of the books about it being unintentional that it would line up with the with pandemic. COVID, yeah, because yeah. Um, yeah. So this came out over the course of four years. Takes place over the course of one day. Amazing. In this character Tybalt's life. Could you imagine working four years on a project where you're reflecting time? That you know, the time of one day, essentially 24 hours. Yeah, and and it's. I mean. We'll get more into it, but to me, this is like this is about as good as it gets for me. Like this is a, a masterful bit of of art and just like a masterful use of this media of this medium to to tell a story. I liked it the first time I read it, and I loved it this time around. I think with a few years or having had the experience of the reread, maybe mm -hmm. more things came through, or just a little bit of perspective, right? Like just a little more life lived. And this book, from start to finish, was. Fantastic laughs, emotional points, um, a lot of relatable stuff, which we'll get into in a bit, right? <laughs> yeah, I was telling Christina, my wife, earlier today, because um, she saw me reading it, and she was like, have you read that before? And I was like, yeah, we're going to do an episode on it. And uh, she was like, oh, do you think I should read it? Because she's constantly trying to get recommendations from me for like comics to read and stuff, um, mostly because she wants to know more about it. And I was like, I actually think this would be really interesting. I would love to hear more um, non-males talk about this book sure. because this is an extremely dude focused book like this is one day not just in the mind of this guy but like you know every single thing this person thinks about over the course of one day and right. it's it is like it's so intimately tied to how this dude thinks but i also think it's like it's a distinctly male perspective not in a chauvinist way but it's like if anyone is interested in kind of how like the a dumb he's not dumb but it's like a uh I don't know how to how to phrase it, but this like it's like dude brain. He, like if you want to know more about dude brain, he leads a rich inner life. Let's put it that <laughs> way. You know, which made me think immediately of uh, Confederacy of Dunces. Ooh, that's it a has good like it yeah. had like that same inner monologue. The whole book is carried through with that kind of like that inner monologue that leads him from one compulsion to the next. Mm -hmm. And it's this like continual bargaining and procrastination that happens where he's playing these little games with himself just to avoid doing the things that he knows he should do, right? Yeah. And that's relatable. Like Completely. we all look for distraction in everything we do most days. A million percent. Yeah. And, and making sure. it a Sunday rather than a Saturday is also genius because I think like Basically, the premise is Sunday he, scaries. He, he Sunday scaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah he wakes totally. Up in the morning, and he's like, "I got the whole day ahead of me. It's going to be the best day. It's going to be a great day." But immediately, you, as the reader, feel the oncoming something. Right? You feel something is is weighing in and pressing in on what he like. He's pressing forward with his day and the things he wants to do, and the end of the day is pressing towards him. You feel this kind of like collapse of the day around him, and so every moment that he wastes with some stupid thought or some tangent he's going on or some procrastinative thing, like you feel the tension of the day slipping away which which creates this underpinning of the of uh intensity i think for the whole thing that i find really palpable and evocative yeah i think that's pretty well observed i also think the interesting use of the limited color palette as it builds mm -hmm. also like contributes to that intensity right totally because he starts overlapping the colors more and more in a way that like becomes well essentially black i mean he go yeah. he fades to black and so this is really interesting too because right off the bat you get a little hello from the author and something about how to read it Essentially, he's saying panels that are rendered in blue and pink illustrate what's going on from moment to moment. Panels with monochromatic pink drawings depict things that happened in the past with variable accuracy. And panels that contain light blue line work and no coloring depict hypothetical situations. Sounds complicated? Don't worry. It will be easy enough. Enjoy. 
O'Shrowen. Now, I watched a video with him. He doesn't really look like No, that. of course not. <laughs> this is really funny. In too. fact, I mean, he's not fooling me for a second. He says this is about his cousin, mm -hmm. Dibbles, who's like imaginary or something he has he he talks in an inter a couple of interviews about how these are the, the characters in this are pastiches of of, of himself course. and other people so like of there's course. a little bit of him in all the characters there's a little bit of his actual cousin in other characters but none of them are based on anyone in particular. yeah and like in the beginning here he does say that it's about his cousin he says this is the life of my cousin thibault we follow him from awakening through breakfast finally into the bathroom where we witness his personal hygiene mm -hmm. so it's like I knew, though, jump right off the bat, I knew these thoughts are too intimate for it to be about someone else. And right. I really saw the auto bio coming through here. And don't let the, the masterful use of Riso throw you off here. This book is so well structured mm -hmm. and so well written. They do this wonderful thing where they're going from one image that links you into the next. And it'll go from different parts of the story acting as like a nodal point that brings you into like a similar but different, you know, vignette or something where we're weaving together separate storylines. Totally. And by the time it gets to the later sections in the book, those um, those points actually start to overlap. They're no longer separate anymore where you're actually you're hearing his thoughts and you're seeing his thought bubble or his thought box over the top of something that's happening somewhere else. But they're interacting in these ways that are just mind bogglingly perfectly woven together like i really yeah. don't i don't know how he did this like i understand how he started it yeah yeah, like, yeah i'm just gonna go moment moment to moment but by the time you get to the, this last volume like the way things interact and the way his like his um seeking like there's a there's a through line here of like seeking sort of some kinds of patterns he's a he's a font designer mm -hmm. is the character yeah and he's seeking these kind of symbol patterns and these things that will become um thoughts i guess or things like he's he's trying to get to these certain different points but he keeps getting distracted i think because he's only seeing these different pieces in all these different places and he has a really hard time aligning and assembling those pieces into something that makes sense which is also such a huge and universal metaphor of like everything in your daily life from day to day is like you're you're absorbing different pieces and you're trying to put them together into something that has some sort of meaning to you and i think tybalt's biggest struggle is like he can't quite assemble all these pieces he keeps getting distracted he wants to like go jerk off or he wants to drink a beer or he sees something outside or he gets frustrated with something or annoyed or he's hungry. And like all of these things are almost preventing him from assembling which, things that are not necessarily, necessarily disparate pieces that should be easy, like sending a text message to your girlfriend to see when she's going to be back home. Right. This, yeah. this sequence takes like 10 pages of him trying to figure this shit out <laughs> and includes one of the funniest jokes in the whole thing, which is like... I can't think of how to write this text message. I'll just kill myself. <laughs> yeah, and then right, he says, right. but I'd still have to write a note. And then thinking about writing a suicide note, I was like, ah, I'm, I'd be right back where I am already. Yeah, like, yeah. And genius. look at all the many panels. So as these intrusive thoughts come into his mind, you can see it starts off in a bath. It's pretty simple. And then the panel structure gets, you know, it goes from two to eight and then seven. And then more, we're going to have, you know, 15 panels here and 20 panels on the next page and what 30 panels on the next page and even more and so you can see him getting confused with more and more thought as this goes on what's the um the, what's that like the closer you get to something you're just subdividing it by half and you never get there the, it's like uh, a paradox of some sort yes 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 oh uh like it when it it's like if you go someplace and you, it's like if you just go halfway there, halfway, halfway, right. there, you never actually reach the The thing. line that never reaches Zeno, zero, Zeno's right? paradox, is that it? That sounds familiar, yeah. I'll look it up. We'll Zeno's it up paradox. Yeah, but what, that what, right. that's another thing that I think is genius about this is that like he gets in the tub and he's like, I guess in the sex message. And then it's like the closer he gets to sending it, the more panels there are on the page. And right. so like he's actually like he's getting farther and farther away and it's getting more and more complicated. Right, yeah. As, yeah, exactly. yeah and just as you said, as it's subdividing, he's almost getting farther away from actually being able to do and it. And then he finally says it, and when he does, it's all it's like... All, it's all typo. Disjointed <laughs> and terrible. And what I love about any text message that he sends, he's then thinking about it as, like, life goes on, and he's just sitting there thinking about well, this, it. And this the, is the message traveling through that space also. It, yeah, right. That's a good point. It travels through the space, and it also is just occupying his mind. As he, And you don't need to know what he's thinking in this point. Totally. Because we've all sent that text message where we're like, 
What? Oh, I, I sent he babies miss you when you home? Yeah. Question mark? <laughs> yeah. That took him, what, 15 minutes? Right, yeah. To or decide what the to length say. of a bath. It could have yeah. been hours for him. Yeah. You know, like, well, I guess it, it says right here that it's from... It's 8.15. So this this book takes place over the course of two hours. So maybe right. the bath was 20 minutes. Or yeah, it could be. Even that, though. Bath I, time. I'm not sure know. I've ever spent 20 minutes thinking about a text message. So essentially the premise is he's at home and it's Sunday, like you said, but his partner is somewhere far away. She's in Africa? I, I'm not sure exactly where. I don't know if it's clear. It might not specifically. Yeah, yeah. But she's quite some – some. he says that she went off on holiday. But it looked like she was doing like some kind of grander work abroad. Well, she's an artist too. She does right. like cyanotypes, cyanotypes and, and painting and stuff. Yeah. So then we go to part two. Okay, so we'll never do this book justice by just doing a quick flip through on here, nor no. do we want to, because no. you should be able to have this book in your hands and flip through it and enjoy all these like layered jokes. And this is what I was talking about when we right away we're talking about um, somebody who you know this is the kind of symbolism that is going from one page to the next, leading you into the next vignette, right? Right, and he starts to introduce these other characters, I guess, like the mouse, the cat and mouse chase becomes a character, which right. I, can, I can only assume is some kind of, like, oncoming mortality. Sure, thought. yeah, it's also, right, like, I think, I don't know if it's this book, but we get into him starting to read, I think, in the next one, and there's a chthonic creature, mm -hmm. is the, the word that they yeah, use. Yeah. Right. He's reading the philosophy book. It also, if we think about it for a second in the terms of cartooning, the cat and mouse is a long-standing, totally. you know, from... Itchy and Scratchy, Tom and Jerry. Crazy and Ignatz, mm -hmm. you know, mouse, like the Spiegelman oh, yeah, totally. work, you know, like there's a lot of relationship and the uh, Matoli um, squeak the mouse, right? Yeah, yeah, which, yeah, is yeah. The, which is the founding material for Itchy and Scratchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so th that's long-standing comics language. Yeah. But this is where we see... Some of this great panel work where he's saying the full color with no holding line is a memory. Right. So him getting into trouble with his cousin. Which is also, I mean, the way you, you just, I didn't even think of that until you said holding line. Like, a memory is Fuzzy. not being held together by anything. Like, this is, these are quick glimpses of things. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and it's like, he's also, sometimes he goes through multiple versions of like, did it happen like this? Did it happen like this? Yeah. It was a memory. Also, I was drunk. And presenting that as just color. That's all. And that somehow, sometimes in some of these books, it's really hard to see. I'm actually, so this book comes out in hardcover from Fantagraphics on October 15th, but it's not Rezo printed. Oh, I mean, interesting. Um, and so I'm actually really interested to see the difference because there are parts of these books that, there are typos, there are um, misprints, yeah. there yep. are parts that I feel like to me like they're missing parts of the drawing or parts of the text, but I kind of feel like the errors in here, but the fact that I don't know if they're errors or not, really serve the whole thing. So I'm curious if it like, by polishing it into a book mm. and printing it offset or however yeah. they do it, yeah. if that changes how it's read at all. Yeah, I mean, I think they did a really good job reproducing Lale's work that was originally Rezoed, sure. but, but I think you're right. I think what we keep saying about Rezo, and I'll say it again, because I think it's relevant, is that there's like an ethereal kind of mist like mm -hmm. quality to the work when it's Rezo printed. And I think you're right. I think if you correct all that maybe you do lose something i know mine has a fingerprint in it from where yeah. i was like handling the pages That's awesome. it's like in two colors they like they grabbed a wet page and there's just like a shred of a fingertip That's on great. one of the pages and i was like that's so cool and here's where we get chthonic creature right yeah there's a sequence in here i don't i think it's this one because i think it's yellow but there are some of the memories are printed in yellow and it almost looks like maybe the yellow cartridge was running low or something. Mm. Like some of the memories are like, I can't really see this, huh. but I kind of feel like it works. Cause it's like, maybe he can't really see this memory either. Like there's something about not knowing that, that, that really adds to, like you said, the ethereal quality of the whole thing. The other thing we should point out is that the book starts with him having a song stuck in his head. Yeah. And that's the James Brown. Music. That's the like, get up, get on up. Get on, get <laughs> Cause, on. Cause immediately he starts off like, get up, get on it like a sex machine right mm -hmm. and immediately we see that we see get up and it's like coordinated with him getting up from bed yeah and immediately we see get up get on it like a sex machine right and so he's singing this throughout and it's playing in his head and 
to me, what is interesting about that is that you can have some music on one thought channel in your brain running mm -hmm. all day, yeah. taking up some of your subconscious, right? And from time to time, it goes back as a refrain to that bum, 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 bum. And I and, hear that and, like... And he does that. Yeah, and I hear the big band, like the trumpets and the brass play when he does that, and I love it. Yeah. And so... And so, it's also how you hear a song in your head. Like when you have a song in your head, you can't hear it. But you, f you have the sensation of being able to hear the sound. 100%. For whatever reason. And there it is again, you know. Like, all throughout the book, he'll reference that. <laughs> as, as in these memories. As brick through the <laughs> totally. liquor store window. <laughs> What's funny, too, is there's a little back and forth with the audience. You know, like, right here in the beginning, he says, Hello, dear reader. You know, he's like, the previous issue garnered many positive comments. But they also some critical notes. He's like, one person emailed me to share his description of our protagonist, Thibault. Saying he's boring, narcissistic dim-witted, even slightly, slightly racist, perhaps you should shift the focus to the, you know, of the story to one of your other characters. And he laughs and says, I would, however, like to laud the bravery of my cousin <laughs> and his generosity in allowing me to share his most intimate thoughts and feelings with an audience of hundreds. Which is double funny because it's not a real person. I love it. It's great. It's so I love good. this. Well, back to the music for a second because I listened to an interview with him earlier today too um, where he talks about the impact of music there's an album cover right there. Yeah, so there's a lot of music in this book. It's the James Brown song. It's uh, he puts on another record later. I don't remember what it is. Yeah, but the noise, it, like the noise music. Like, yeah, he's like, I, I can't have any words right now, and so he goes with a, with a more of like a soundscape. Yeah, and the and those things come back in at different times, and and so Sharon in this interview says something about how he was kind of trying to make a piece of music on the paper. And he was thinking of the storylines in kind of like certain shapes in terms of mm. having like crescendos, choruses, and improvisation. So it's a combination of like you want you want to build some rising action, which is tricky to do when you're just dealing with one guy's brain. Sure. Um, but that was that's like a goal to keep in mind while you're doing this. Um, so creating some choruses, some moments for repetition, and bringing things back in and overlapping, and then allowing space for improvisation. And I, I really like those three things as like you don't have to have a full script. You don't have to have like everything planned out but if you if you give yourself these like loose goals and allow yourself to play in it mm. if you keep those goals in mind that'll give you a framework enough to keep going which i, I love is that really cool i love that and here we're seeing some just the holding line which is hypothetical situation i think at first i was challenged to figure out what was memory and what wasn't mm -hmm. but then you kind of quickly get it you're like oh yeah okay so these these, also, these are ridiculous yeah they're ridiculous <laughs> totally exactly but you know it, it, it was just misleading to me because I took it very literally and he switches color frames, right? So right. he goes from pink and blue in this one, right? Using complementary colors mm -hmm. to blue and gold in this one. And then in the next one, I imagine it's still blue and gold. And then he switches. Oh, it's this one. This, it's, this one's, I think, yellow. Maybe the last one is gold or cornflower. Oh, okay, okay. Some of these memories are really oh, hard yeah, to see. Oh, yeah, this is really faint. Yeah. And there's also some word balloons in different places where, like, it, there's no text in them. And it's like, did they fuck up printing? Did he forget what they said in that thing? Like, Interesting. I, I, and like, yeah. he's remembering one part of this, but not the rest of it. Right. Like, I, I just love that I don't know how much of that is intentional mm, or not. That's cool. I think mine was, a, I don't want to dispel your illusion because I think mine was a little more visible than no, this. It's fine. Yeah. I've, I've talked to other people, too, because I've asked them this. Question. This is. Um, this is. Sometimes he'll put the print the print number on there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I think they're all kind of different. I think like yeah, that's the they are. Of printing but I remember like, when he was printing it, it's like this is a first edition of 600 copies. Yeah, this it is says first, down there this at the is bottom. The second edition, the first. This yeah, one. and I have like third edition, second ed or first edition, and then this is like. But yeah, I mean that you're right. Like, it's like going to see a play with different actors or something. Yeah. Every time you go, like, if you went to see a play on a Tuesday and I saw the same play three weeks later, they're going to be slightly different and talking about it is interesting. So he moves through different color pairings and in this one he's using, like, a brown and a blue. And what you were saying about weaving all the storylines together, you know, he does that in a really skillful way and I wonder how much of that was planned because I don't think a lot of it was. And what happens is that when these storylines weave together... All the colors start to pair together. Mm -hmm. You have orange and blue, pink and blue again, until the last issue is mostly black. Yeah, once they all so come together. So all four colors that he's working with, CMYK or whatever, cyan, yellow, and magenta, all come together to make black in the end, which I think is great because that's when this storyline resolves in real time mm -hmm. and we see everything kind of converge. I just think that's a great choice. It's, it's really great. well done. And it's I find this ending, the ending of this book, to be like really heartfelt, really sweet, and really 
like tender i don't know like a lot of these characters in a, in lesser hands i think could be real stereotypes like the character of rick his like party mm-hmm. his party friend yeah i think ends up being like <clears throat> so much more complicated than he sees, seems at first because at first he's only seen in flashbacks and he has like no pants on <laughs> and they're like they're fucking fucked up like they're yeah, wasted yeah, out yeah. of these memories like it, like this is so beautiful too like that's not a drawing that's just like an impressionistic version of a face as it's like coming into his mind um anyway so he could be very easily just be like the party guy right you know from a panel like this but he ends up being way more complicated way more interesting and actually very sweet in in so many ways i like when people take their time to develop their characters um in more than one direction especially when they do like you said start really basic this was a great scene such a great because he's like jerking off and this is the moment of orgasm for him but it's also he'd been thinking about food before Mm -hmm. and his neighbor we cut to his neighbor going to get the food and eats it and he has a moment of revolt while he has a a moment of ecstasy yeah. and they happen simultaneously which is pretty amazing yeah these little these little overlaps how do you think what do you if you had to guess at the process here not the resale printing but the drawing process what do you think he's doing uh so i, I read a little bit about that today, oh you so did why don't you answer that question okay. first because i read a little i, I, I kind of know a little bit i mean i didn't thing. just sit, prompt that so that i could say my bit no, you no, know but i, I do I think, have the theory because i have an answer i feel like i want to hear okay the all right so so in one of these comics he's talking about art and I thought it was the closest he gets to actually making art because he starts off who t- the character, the character of Thibault. Yeah. He starts off really upset that, um, that he has to design a typeface today. Yeah. And, and not only that, but he gets a really passive aggressive email from his boss. Of just course. Like t- sends him down a, a road of anger. And I think there's this thing, and I don't know if anyone else experiences this, but when you have a job that is paying you, you on some level, you're like resenting that you have to finish it. You know, you're like, you know, you're pay- it's paying you, but you're like, I don't want to do this. I never wanted to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm only doing this because it, I there's money at the end and I need it. But at one point, what he does is he's reviewing like his earliest work, which is his film that he made as an art project. Yeah, which I think is actually really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a great it, like the special effects in it and stuff were awesome. They, they make a horror movie, but like <clears throat> stuff happens in the movie that ends up they like like they someone looks at practical effects. effects they use yeah. practical effects to spell out t- kind of like text uh, sound effects yeah. in the in the film. And there's lots of great use of font in that, and that again harkens back to his graphic design font making character right Mm -hmm. he was always this character was always interested in fonts and creating them which is another reason why the present that they make for him is so meaningful right because it's like bringing that theme home is amazing Mm -hmm. so but this was telling for me so in this he stops the film he finds some tape and some paper and a marker he puts it up on the wall I see all of these drawings as being like a projection of a trace now if he's doing it Some of it, I'm sure, is very familiar. So once he's done it a million times, he doesn't need to do it anymore. Like, he probably has a lot of this. Mm -hmm. But I think he's mocking up photos and either digitally tracing them or it wouldn't wouldn't make... It wouldn't be efficient to project every single image. Mm -hmm. But I think for a lot of what he's doing here, he's he's just projecting, getting the outline, and then digitally coloring with, like, an airbrush or something, and then separating those color layers. Now, that was a tip off to me i had that feeling anyway because these feel like they feel like traced images but i don't want to take i'm not saying that in a pejorative way i just mean like i've made images like this before where i have the key details it's like almost too accurate but then missing a ton and one of the other things that tipped me off was in the last issue when he's very very funnily watching the tom hanks movie he's he's watching the da vinci code the da vinci code not only tearing it apart but like he reaches he like transcends the being able to tear something apart where he's no longer watching it ironically he's like ascended to (laughs) some other form of watching this so it was this part here where it's like he's no stranger to depicting genitalia in this but because i believe he stopped the film to trace it digitally and there was no visual information there because on the movie they probably don't have his junk just hanging out he just left that blank i don't know like to me like these likenesses are very they feel like digital copies is what i'm saying so i don't that's that was where i was with it again not i'm not throwing shade i'm just like this becomes its own language mm-hmm. and for that like I'm super grateful. I love this book. I'm not taking anything away from it. But I was saying if I was going to try to approximate this style, how would I go about doing it? And I think that's how I would do it. 
So, I, I, from my understanding, some of that is true, um, and some of it isn't. So, the way he describes it in this interview that I read, that I listened to, I read one from TCJ, and I listened to one from this site called wearevarious.com. We'll put the link in the thing. Um, but what he said is that he draws everything really small first. So, he draws almost all of it he draws by hand. Mm, um, okay, way off small. Then. Um, however, he did say that for faces, sometimes he'll find a picture of a face online and trace it for a spe- for a really specific kind of emotion. Sure. So, like, there's some there are some faces in here and some close ups, especially where someone's doing something, responding to something in a certain way, right. and for that he'll drop in uh, a photo he's found online of somebody who doesn't look like the character, and then kind of draw the character on top of it. Um, I would assume that for the Da Vinci Code stuff, he probably was pulling screen screen grabs from that. Yeah. But he, the way he described it is like, if you draw something really small, you can maintain a certain level of uh, consistency that you might not be able to do if you're sketching it at size. And then he blows up the small s- thumbnails and then kind mm. of elaborates on them. Um, and uh, but my guess was that you're not totally off because I would bet that when you when you trace enough faces, even if you, even if those faces are not what's prominently portrayed in the book by tracing faces you get to know faces really well yeah and so i think part like these books i'm astonished at how consistent these characters absolutely look. and i think part of that probably comes from like a, a past history of, tra- of tracing faces yep. and being able to get those little details and the and the, like this i like believe that, comes for sure from photo. for sure for sure um, but yeah i think you're right i think it's a style that evolves out of yes. that that practice right totally. because if he comes from a fine art background which i'm guessing he does with just like his interests and in things i see like a uh, you know, if you start doing that when you're young and you do that consistently, it becomes your style. It informs your practice. Mm-hmm. You don't, you can take the training wheels off then. You can write a 500 page book and do it in that style without having to do every image. Totally. But I see that influence here and it's just because of the way I know from drawing. You know, it's like I know that when I take a digital photo and I get like the, the points of it, it, it looks a certain way and it had that familiarity to me. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think over time that just became the style. I mean, even something yeah, like this sure. like looks so human. I could imagine taking pictures of someone four times doing this thing and then drawing it. But my understanding is that this is just this is a way that he processes faith. He's he, like yeah. some some people are just so observant about these things. You internalize the movements. Maybe he looks in your mirror or something to really get all the nuance. But um, my understanding is that a lot of this is just from the dome. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, some sometimes it's about a detail level that I like I'm like that's really specific you know oh, yeah I have the same thought especially for rooms and stuff like that it's yeah, really, yeah, when yeah. I think of a room it's really hard to get past the 10% uh, of what a room looks like in general and really go push it to get all the details in there the other thing that I like about this is that it all kind of like coalesces into the form right that's the point right like when you're making work all of your choices all of them that you've ever made kind of like congeal into what will be the final thing Mm -hmm. this is so well done i don't want anyone to mistake my uh disassembling the process for any kind of criticism in that way i just think it's interesting i'm like i want to know yeah yeah. it's curiosity it's like i want to know how which steps did they take to get to this like and then it becomes the cartooning that it looks so effortless and like you were saying is so consistent and then like layering up the forms on top of each other you can see him really experimenting with his own style by the time he gets into this book Mm -hmm. i think that's an interesting choice too like (laughs) what what always happens to me when i have these books out is i go okay one and two okay great but wait this is five Five, six six, seven seven. x and i'm like wait where's four and then i'm like oh he put four together with three and then he released four issues together first of all props for keeping them consistent size yes but it always confuses me that four is tucked into three here Maybe because it didn't say it on the front. The I front think on the one I have, it says it on the back. Oh, but but still, you know, like, I still don't see it. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. this this was such a joy to read this. I got to say, like, you <laughs> you can do way worse. This this was so lovely. Totally. I had one more thing to say about the symbols. Oh, yeah, so I like, got stuff to say. But... I mean, we can talk about this forever. <laughs> I also, like, I, I am hesitant to look through the whole thing because I don't want people to um, not read it because they feel like they got a handle on it. Like... There's so much in here you could never dis- discuss it all. That's right. Um, but anyway, there's the, he goes on this quest after he's watching. He watches this old college film he made where he sees these like big typographical things, and then he has a he has a crush on one of the women who is in the movie, 
And then he starts looking at the way she's posing and how they start to make letter forms here. So he's trying to spell out what she's saying. She's spelling go away. So in the film, she was ha he was having the people make these letter forms and these symbols and stuff. And then from that, he takes this picture of her, traces it, and finds a, a, a symbol in this, which becomes like the letter N. And so then for a large chunk of the rest of the book, he starts seeing these symbols in all kinds of things. And it becomes almost this like conspiracy theory that like messages are coming to him. Like when he looks at her Instagram right. of thing, it's just, he starts to think that like all of her photos are making symbols that are spelling in a message for him or something like that. And then Shrowen, the artist, not T Tybalt, starts giving us these overlapping symbols too. Like this one really jumped out at me. It's like the frying pan. That's also like the sewage treatment plant. Um, so like we are now being given these visual symbols and as a reader, we're suddenly primed to start ourselves looking for these symbols. So I don't right. know about you, but once I got deep into this book, I started being like, I started looking at the way he was posing the character and being like, wait, is this a message? Is oh, this saying something? Like and that. so it was like priming me to look deeper into this book, which is also, I feel like priming us all to look deeper into, um, just like the world around us. Like whenever I whenever I read this, I've read this a couple times. I've read the early ones a few times and I've read the whole thing twice, I think. And it, it just feels like it's like asking us to like look a little bit more around us and not so much inside of us. I like um, It's so tied into his brain and his thoughts. And because that becomes so annoying and the people around him are doing all these <laughs> other things, I, I just kind of feel like Sean's yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it feels like there's an intention here to get us to look outside of our own brain a little more. And it's like a almost like a call to action to be like, this is what you become if you're only an internal person. And, you know, to your point, he starts right from the beginning with the number games, mm -hmm. adding up the numbers and being like, oh, one plus seven equals eight. Uh, eight plus eight is 16. One plus six is seven. Can't escape the seven. Let's stay in bed till 820. He doesn't want to get up on a seven. So yeah, <laughs> and that like, these things repeat throughout, like you were saying, those motifs. And they do like, and you, in 2018, I saw Austin English interview him at Comic Arts Brooklyn, right? I just happened to go to that one. 18, you said? Yeah, 2018. Cool. And he says, so this, sorry, this started in 19, right? So that's before. Yeah, so this, he was talking about parallel lives at that time. Cool. Which I think we also have here. Yeah, that's a, that's a collection of short Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt no, you no, before. Please, keep going. I was just got so excited because what you were saying is something that he mentions directly in this. No, and he says, um, Olivia says, uh, for, his, for him, comics are therapy. The artist talks about writing as following a hunch that readers often project their own resolutions onto his open-ended story's conclusions. He relays that people project onto simplistic forms in the hopes of sounding smart, that people do not want to be told. They want to discover. Finally, holding up comics as a vehicle to work out one's own psyche, which at that point I wrote reminded me of a quote from the painter Mike Cloud saying, it painting emotionally organizes my thoughts and allows me to externalize and reflect on my emotional engagements. Mm. So I made an association there. But one of the things Olivier was talking about is like, comics or therapy like i'm trying to work it yeah. out like i'm figuring it out as i go and and he does talk about that too he says um he he speaks of a deep need to create comics for his own taste he says that he tells stories to himself and the mystery of where it is going is interesting to him he says he purposely stays away from conventional narrative formulas and conclusions and I think that's like something we're divining from the work. Like yeah. we're, we're saying like, that's we're, great. We're reading that like loud and clear and then just see it. Like, I mean, it's like the way he wove it together is pretty great. I mean, he probably had a destination in mind, right? Cause from the beginning yeah. we hear some of these characters talking about where they're going and where they're headed. Yeah. There's some key moments I think that are like, t like what do they call them? Tent poles. Really? Yeah. Like, and we had a talk about this just before we got on camera tonight saying like, if you just keep it loose and you're like in the flow, you like create space for the, or I think we said, wait, actually the more focused you are, the more the ideas tend to overlap and reflect each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're not thinking about it too much. You're not like, I gotta make sure this connects to this. You're just allowing it to happen. Um, I forget if we talked about this before, but I did a book recently and I put, there was like a lot of collage in it. I was just like cutting out little phrases from magazines that I had accumulated from school. And those, those magazines span probably 50 years. Like they were donations from Whoa. parents. It was like old National Geographic's, Vogue magazines. They were coming from all over the place. Shit I found in the closet that had been there since before I started, whatever. 
but I was just cutting out little things I thought would be interesting to place next to the drawings that were mostly mm. sketchbook drawings and stuff. And there were mostly things I just thought were kind of funny or like provocative or something. And then I was nervous when I finished the book and I hadn't looked through it all yet. I was like, I was like, is this like too random? Is this a cop out? Like I, I kind of felt like I hadn't put enough thought into it. But then when I printed the book out and I read through it, it has a shocking to me amount of uh, coherency where mm. like these little random bits I was cutting out for magazines from different decades all kind of at least in my mind serve like things that i'm actually thinking about act, uh, act actively like they were surprisingly coherent in the way that these totally random bits actually did sort of add up to like a a, a kind of vague perspective that's amazing and, point. and that's something that happened you think like subconsciously intentionally or it was specific like um an external collaborator, or it was like... I, have, I mean, that's, that's an, I had something I hadn't thought of before. External collaborator is an interesting way to phrase it. I was thinking more like, like you said, like we're just, I was just in the zone. Like I wasn't mm. thinking too much mm -hmm. about it. I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't like, does this really fit? Does this not fit? Right. I wasn't second guessing anything. It was just putting it down there. And I think it was just relying on instinct. I like that. Ended up making it more consistent than it might've been if I had overthought every little bit of it and making sure it fit the right spot. Just like flow state. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I read in a little essay by Frank Miller and he was talking about his collaboration with Klaus Janssen as being a third artist. Mm. That their collaboration was a third artist that was greater than the sum of its parts. Whoa, that, I like and that. I was that's like, that's cool. such a cool way to think about it. Like, it wasn't just him. It wasn't just me. It was an amalgam that became its own thing, right? And even me saying it in that way is less kind of like uh, romantic than the way he said it, right? Which was a third artist. A third we artist, became a third yeah. artist. So like we, we Voltroned up and became like a, <laughs> a mega artist, right? But, you know, I think of that often and... You, Jim Woodring said something similar. He said that when he makes his comics, if he projects his ideas and gets in his own way, the comic is terrible. Mm. But when he opens up and lets what he calls an external collaborator, that's where I cribbed that from, then the work goes to like magical places that he could never himself go mm -hmm. with his conscious mind. And when I met him, I said, Jim, do you meditate? And he's like, yeah. Cool. And I was like, Hell yeah. And he goes, do I know you from somewhere? And I was like, no, just I the just astral got... plane, baby. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was like, nah, I just got one of those faces. That's, that's he was a, real that's cool. Really interesting. Yeah. And with that that might be a topic for another episode is like the flow state and accessing these kind of, there's really no other way to describe it other than the flow state or the, the subconscious creative id or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times like less skillful interview people will say, you know, where do ideas come from? That's mm. a question you get a lot, right? Sure. As a creative person. And I think there's a reason why we're portrayed as like sensitive artist types, because being sensitive means being aware. Sensitivity is awareness. If you're yeah. open and aware, you're going to feel a lot of things. And, right. and I think you have to be that to, to catch ideas. And it's empathy and it's being observant. And it's all of the things, you know, yeah. it's like, it's, you're, you're, your band is wider. Your radio band is wider. It's open more. You can catch different frequencies. And I think ideas travel in that space that is like liminal or is outside the purview of, of people who feel like they cannot access it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not saying one is directly related to another, but I'm saying it helps, right? right? Just open up, open up. And, and, and I was hearing something that was interesting earlier, which was like, I think it was Aldous Huxley that said like, the genius is the person who protected the child, who approaches everything with curiosity. I'm paraphrasing, by the way, but with curiosity and childlike wonderment. Mm. Like this idea that like to be creative or at least for it to reach your adulthood, you had to protect the child in you that was curious and had zeal and like would go after things with earnest energy, you know, and be excited. And I think what we see here is some of that, you know? We see this character. <laughs> he's constantly putting stuff in his mouth. He's just a goof. Like, yeah. most of the time he's a goof. And it's like, the first time I read this, I was like, well, Thibault is a procrastinator. You know, I wanted really quickly to, like, to distance myself from this character because I wanted to be more productive than him with my day. You mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. Like, I think the first initial response is, like, he's always talking about jerking off or drinking or smoking. But if we think about what those things are... Those are just like human distractions, mm -hmm. right? That we all think about pleasure 
And we all think about well, what's the next thing I can do? You know, a lot of people are like, I need, I want a snack or I want a cookie or something, right? His are like, I want a cigarette or I'm yeah. gonna smoke this joint or I'm gonna jerk off. Or even just, I'm gonna be annoyed at something. And right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. Go for it. Yeah. I was gonna say, and they, and because he starts to have some of these realizations later by the end too. Like you see him go through this day, and by the end of the day, he starts to kind of have not epiphanies, but you feel a tiny I incremental bit of growth of how he's looking at the way he deals with his own life and his ability to kind of go about the day. Yeah, his like his view is so myopic, but it's the same reactions. At least at the start, it's, it is. But it's the same reactions we all have, where he's like, "Why do I have this phone? Like, who wants to text people? Yeah, like, it's so fragile. He's like, this. it's so fragile. It's so expensive. He's like, this is how we're supposed to communicate as humans by texting. He's like, there's so many great jokes in here where he's <laughs> like, yeah, this text communication was put put like supplanted onto us by nerds forced upon us yeah by yeah dorks. exactly yeah. he's like <laughs> so he's like very critical of everything that is um modern mm -hmm. as like an affront to humanity but he also just plays both sides of the fence so he's like happy to be offended happy to be critical but then immediately like oh i should get another coffee or yeah. i should get another beer and i think that's very relatable like mm -hmm. totally this like kind of simultaneous rejection and participation in the modern world as we then look for a distraction from it i think creates like an everyman i completely agree and i and um you had reminded me earlier that one time i brought up this book and i was like oh he's just like a there it's about this like dumbass guy who's just like an idiot and i was pleasantly um uh, reminded i guess this time reading it where i was like he's not stupid he's not a stupid person this book would not be interesting if this guy was just a bumbling fool right like yeah. part of what makes this interesting is that he is a thoughtful person he is an artist like yeah, yeah. when he starts assembling those symbols and kind of like the the creative process he goes through to parse some of these symbols and the way he's looking at these little marks and trying to transcribe them into something and the way he's talking about language and the way he's talking about how human beings communicate through language and how that's what separates us from certain things like they even sound kind of pedantic as i'm saying them out loud right now but the way they're they're the way he's grappling with these issues as he's also thinking about you know these kind of racist thoughts about his girlfriend getting abducted by a terrorist and stuff like that at the same time he's also this like thoughtful considerate person who is engaged in the world around him just maybe not in like the most productive ways or maybe not this day you know, or maybe not this <laughs> yeah, day right, right totally and that might be because he's just like smoking weed and drinking his dad's beer all day yeah you know? right exactly and like i think we've all had a day indoors where we uh acted in a similar fashion Co where a million. Like, i've had many days in like pajamas this. and one of the things you were saying is like that's his approach into the creative process so like that's his approach in. Mm -hmm. it's not everyone's approach in but that's one way in he like kind of gets up has his coffees kind of farts around on the computer it's a kind of leisurely day it is an interesting critique of like the artist's mind right mm -hmm. because yeah he is very smart and i was thinking my dad used to say too smart for your own good and it was like you can get lost in thought you can be too smart and not, and be ineffectual you know totally like that's what we're in my opinion it was like he He's entertaining himself. He's creating thought games. And like you said, making connections, trying to put juxtapose things and see what no, if something new comes out of it mm -hmm. and like apply his weird codex to the way he looks at the world. Even so much that when he shatters his phone, he is trying to read the message that has come through and yeah. goes, maybe if I line up the cracks with this cobweb, that like this actual cobweb that's hanging here, oh, yeah. it'll reveal but, a secret message to me. And he's like, no, that's right. Immediately, he's like, what the fuck am I talking about? Like, <laughs> yeah. this is not a fantasy novel. Right. Like, the, the great thing about this is that there is that bit of, in, in all of us, where we go off on a fanciful notion and immediately check ourselves back. Mm -hmm. You know, he does that quite often. Like, in one of my favorite jokes in the book, he goes, Maybe I'm like Elon Musk on a spaceship being a bro and drinking beers. And he goes, no, fuck that immediately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And I was like, hell yeah. He allows himself to have these thoughts. And then it's it's almost like this implicit bias thing where like acting on that thought would be horrible. But having the thought is just a thought. That's a good point that you brought up implicit bias because that what drives a lot of these thoughts, I think, compulsive and implicit bias. And it, it reminds me of having done that moderator training recently. Right, yeah, I'm sure we've, we've anyone who works with kids has done something like that. Everyone this. has implicit bias. Every single person has it. It's how you react to your own thought that matters, right? Com completely. We are not our thoughts. Um, right. And then he even goes, again, I don't want to spoil anything from this book. It's tough to spoil, but... I don't I think, think we can really spoil. Just, I, I think I, we're doing a pretty good job of like... I hope so. 
Yeah. So he, he has this. <laughs> Hold uh, on, let me congratulate myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, he has this tangent too, where he he adopts this kind of stand-up comedian persona in his brain that then morphs into this like interactive TED Talk thing. But that's cool. <laughs> that's cool too because you can kind of feel it's like so good. You can kind of feel him getting annoyed by his own thoughts and being like, "What if somebody else said these things? Is it funny if somebody else said this? Would this be funny if I was watching it?" And he starts then interrogating these these thoughts as if he's hearing them from someone else, which is this other layer of like. I don't know, personal investigation or self-reflectiveness. Like yeah. he's not, he's not a stupid guy just bumbling around. Like this would not be to me interesting at all. If this was, you know, Fred Flintstone, um, fucking around and not, not doing his like husbandly duties like that, that, that right, that's not right, interesting right, art right. at all. This exactly, is, this yeah. is a deep, profound investigation into how a person's mind can work and the the implications of like if your mind this works this way how does that affect your life the people around you your friendships your relationships whatever like to me this is like incredibly profound profound i think is a, is a great word for yeah. it it's like it's this is rich a rich interrogation like it's not just it's not a, not just for yucks yeah i mean our character is not a derelict and i think a sign of intelligence is investigating like you're saying a sign of intelligence is curiosity it is questioning you know that that's not a failing that's a trajectory yeah you know that's a destination that's an implied destination yeah and so when you do see him finally touch something creative the character i mean in the book it's pretty exciting because you're like exciting. oh he's gonna make art now yeah you're like yes this is what i'm here for <laughs> it's like a superhero and then thing he's where like, like he, he's tried on the costume <laughs> he's fallen off the building a few times now he's gonna like go solve a crime or something i don't know i was um i just because of time and reading eight issues of a comic, I mean, these are not slight issues. These are thick. No. They're like 40 pages each I or probably, something. I probably read the whole thing in about three and a half hours, maybe three hours. Yeah, I think so each pa- a- I think each book is about 40 pages, right? So eight issues times this one's even more. This I one's think like the, 60 I think pages. I looked at it earlier. I think the hardcover is over 400 pages. Okay, so just in the sense of time, like I read these today and because it was 400 pages of comics, I was a little pressed. I didn't get to luxuriate in all of it as much as I'd like. But I had read it previously, and I did luxuriate in the front half, and I kind of sprinted in the second half. Um, this book will reward you every time you read it. Yes. I, I think w- there's something new in there for you every time. I was just going to say the same thing. I read it. I, didn't, I got the first two together, so I didn't read it right when it came out. Um, I bought these two together, and then when this one came out, I got it fresh. And when that one came out, I got it fresh. So over the course of a couple of years... And then each time a new one came out, I reread the ones before it. Mm. But I've only read this one um, twice. But I was just thinking earlier today, I was like, I would be thrilled. I'm thrilled at the possibility of revisiting this at other points in my life. Like, I, I can't imagine ever getting rid of these. I just think there's so much here of yeah. value. Technically, philosophically, humorously. Like, it's just, it's working on every possible level. You know when you're laughing out loud on the train in public that... They, yeah. they got you good, you know, because, like, you are forgetting yourself. I mean, and, you know, to your point, like... Oh, that whole church sequence of, like, the, the piano. Yeah, the oh. piano in the church. Amazing. And, you know, another thing I was thinking about, which you brought up um, when we were talking about a different comic, we were, had been reading All-Star Superman for Comics Club, mm-hmm. and you were like, when I reread this as an adult, like, in my 40s, it had a totally different implication because of the looming death. Yeah, it's, you know. a, it's a it's a person who has never thought about their own mortality before grappling with death. Which, when I read it at twenty two, that like that's different from when you're forty one. Hundred percent, and that and that exists here as well. Yeah. In this book, this like the Sunday, the 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 corpse of the day, as it goes on, is felt by all the characters, mm-hmm. but specifically our main character. I'm looking for a specific page now. Of course, I can't find it, and I just had it. But the idea is. You can feel the day coming to a close, and it does echo, you know, the character's thoughts of his own mortality. And I thought that that was handled really well. Yeah, it's not, it's not, um, it's not heavy handed. Not hackneyed or heavy handed. Yeah, everything done, everything here is done with a light hand, uh, with the exception of maybe this one panel. I really hate that but, panel. Like, <laughs> it's really I thought it was great. I mean, it's an amazing drawing, but it's like so as, a, as a cat person, it's really brutal. Oh yeah, sorry. Well, I didn't mean it to like, you know. No, um, I know. I'm not trying to revel in the gore. I just thought like. You know, depictions of that type of sort are very difficult to do well. Yeah, and it's especially to do well in a way that's not shock value. It's this it serves the narrative, like the, yeah. the cat not getting the mouse. Right. Is I mean, there's a lot going on there. Like, 
We had mentioned previously about skillful Riso, and I think this book is a really great example of all the things Riso can do. Yeah, completely. And that's why I wanted to be very clear earlier when I was saying like about process, you know, this is challenging the form. It's doing different, every different kind of texture, lighting. It's doing it all so very well that I just want everybody to be very, uh, very clear that I'm a huge fan. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's doing something with the with the medium and the delivery device in mind. And it's it's another thing I always look for with great great storytelling of any medium. I think should only be able to work in that medium because if it if it's if something could translate to another medium, you're not taking advantage of the form enough. In my in my opinion, that's, that's not like a hard and fast rule. But I like, mean, I think that's cool. Like I, I like can't that. if I read a book, I can't watch the movie. If I watch a movie, I can't read the book. Like one of them feels derivative of the other sure. one. Sure. And this is something you could. I don't think you could ever adapt this in a way that would have, that would even come close to the impact that this has. You like you could film this or make it a TV show, but you would have to do it differently. You could never just take what he's saying or thinking. You could never just have a person acting this. It's just not the same. Like the delivery and the the uh, just the, yeah. I guess the format of this thing is the thing. Yeah, th I mean, this book is so beautiful. Like. I, when I first saw, when I very first picked it up and saw it, I probably underestimated it. And that just goes to show you how much distance I traveled to just be the hugest fan of it. Yeah. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of like, I was like, is this a K? Is this a Y? Well, like what, you know, is, is mm -hmm. he, is there something here? Did he, is there a reason he made this page a full page? Is it just to emphasize this? Is there, is, should I be noticing something here? I'm not seeing it's like, it make it brings you in. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. I think discovery is a huge thing, right? He was saying, and I think you're right. I think that that just leads you in by the, like grabs you and pulls you into the, into the world. Mm -hmm. So cool. It's great. Anyway, so this book comes out, it's hard to track down the single ones, I think, cause they are Risa printed and there's not that many of them. Yeah. Relatively, but the, the Fanographics collection comes out October 15th, I think. What else do we got here? This is all the other show and stuff I have. This is the That's first. So much stuff. Yeah, we, don't, we guess we can't go through. No, it. we won't go through all of it. But um, I mean, I I want to flip through some of it and look it at and it. Look I think it's it. so cool. This I got at Bergen Street Comics. Rest in peace. Uh, I think Matt Seneca was the first to tell me about Shrawen. Um This was the first book of his I got. It's shorts, very wide range of styles. Um, he mentions in the interview that he was one of the first things that made him want to make comics was Windsor McKay, and I can totally see that mm. uh, influence. I wouldn't have thought of that, but hearing him say that makes a lot of sense. Um, right, so almost all of his stuff comes out as Rizzo uh, zines first, and then gets collected uh, and bound up by one person or another. I think usually Fantagraphics. This one is, yeah, Fanta. They're just on it. I mean, they just, they, they scoop everything up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for that's better fair. For worse. Yeah, that's fair. That's a good point. Uh, but I, if I'm looking, but if I'm, but if I'm like in a store that's selling used books and I'm in the, you know, the illustrated kind of like sequential art comics, graphic novels section, whatever you want to call it, cartoons, I will check the spines. And if it says fanographics, I'm going to pick it up. I'm interested. Yeah. Because most of the time I can trust that that's a book that is going to speak to me on some level. Yeah. Or it's just like a cut above whatever else might be there. The random stuff. Yeah. And I, I think, I don't know how much of this is Shroud or how much of this is anybody else, but also like, look at the difference in these two books. These are both fantagraphics books. This is soft cover, floppy, super glossy, you know, full color reproduction. This is awesome. stuff. I, gotta read. I have this at home. I got to reread this. This book hardcover uh stamp i think some of the colors stamped into the hardcover it's on an extremely different paper Whoa. stock i think this is offset printed that's awesome that um, looks great. this book you should borrow this this book is unbelievable like this sweet. is i don't think this hits quite as hard as sunday but like this to me is another just absolute grand yeah, slam I mean, you see his like the seeds of all of his ideas right it's also a wildly different story sure sure um, and it's super funny but it um, looks like even when we're talking about here right we're saying like these things that he focuses on and the symbols of those in his life, mm -hmm. this is stuff that we're going to see over and over again. <laughs> Bullshit artistry. I love it's great. the awareness level entrapment, like new acquaintances, a guy with a bat, <laughs> you know, like I love this, his ability to connect these kind of like very simple symbols. And that's why the, in this book in Sunday in, the later one where he's talking about Da Vinci Code, <laughs> that scene of Tom Hanks talking and giving that talk, he's talking about symbols. Right. So it makes so much sense in the context of the book. And then even in that part, he's like, pauses it, goes off on this digression, comes back to it and he goes, 
wait, they skipped it? Yeah. He's like, bullshit. <laughs> like, they didn't even do that. Oh, this is what I came here for. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. like, where, where, where are we now? Oh, we got a hipster monk now. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm with the monk now. I'm with, oh, look at how good looking he is, you know? Oh, yeah, that's right. Hit yourself with that that's thing. Good. He's like, the narration is on point. It's like the way we experience life. Totally. You know? And then he's, he takes a digression, too, which I've done when I've been smoking weed and watching movies, which is like, I'm no longer paying attention to the movie. I'm interrogating how I'm watching the movie <laughs> yeah, or like right. why I'm watching the movie. You've removed um, yourself from yourself. Yeah, you're watching it's, it's the like third person. Four levels removed. Um, this uh, this I've only read once. I want to revisit this. This was drawn by Sharon and written by Rupert and Mulot. I I can only assume that this was not a binary thing. It's not like they wrote it he, and he drew it. I can only assume this was a collaboration just because sure. of. Just because of how comics work, obviously. Right. Um, it, this does kind of feel like a Shroud book, even though I think the dialogue moves a little differently. I remember really liking it. I would definitely have to read it again to to be able to discuss it. So we're gonna save that for another time. Oh yeah. What's um, this? And then this is a uh, Mowgli's Mirror. This is, I think, totally Whoa. silent. Just Whoa. a beautiful little simple tale. Um, and I just think this this dude doesn't miss, man. All of this shit is worth tracking down. It's all. It all sticks with you long after you read it. Like there are there are very few. I would put him in my like top yeah, he's three great. or maybe top three comic artists, top three artists in general. Like this this is the he's dude. Great. He's just working. He just he doesn't he doesn't miss. You know, one of the things he said when he was interviewed was that his father collected comics. Oh yeah. And I have this theory, and I'll try it out here and see what you think. You know, we we talk about what we come to as adults, and I think part of what we come to as adults is like. We come back to things that we saw our parents enjoy because when we were kids, they were happy. Hmm. And I think I think of this as far as myself and my journey back to comics. My dad collected comics and there were very few things that made my dad happy. Right. One of them was comics. One of them was like classic rock. <laughs> and yeah. And, and one of them's baseball. Right. Baseball kind of missed me, but I came back for comics. And I think part of it is like. I feel like it's fulfilling to me on some subconscious level because it was fulfilling to my dad. Interesting. It's like completing some kind of circuit or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I wonder if we ever meet Shrowen, I, I, I would like to ask him a similar question. Like, how much was that an influence? You know, more than just the form. Uh, Gabe said something really interesting the other day at the rescue party thing. He was like, I think a book is like a friend to humanity. Yeah. And I think that that was a really cool sentiment. Like... A book is a friend to humanity. Yeah, I totally agree. And it, it will, it, they will outlast the internet, most likely. Um, unless, you know, we flood and... Flood right, the, flood the fire. Well, yeah, that. paper's not um, really great friends with, um, with water and fire. But I will say this. I love the um, Nespresso machine. <laughs> yeah. Because this, like, encapsulates the perfect... It's like a push button, you get a coffee. Yeah. So you just go, bang, and it goes, bang, and it gives you your coffee, right? Yeah. This is the procrastinator's tool of choice like this is the modern all i gotta do is push this little button and a coffee comes out i could do that all day and i have i drank I have six or seven coffees when, out of this thing and i worked like, in offices it was a like i'd be bored and be like i don't want to work right now i'm gonna walk across the floor which i know takes about eight minutes i'm gonna make a coffee i'm gonna stand and make chit chat with people i don't like that's gonna take <laughs> another 10 minutes and i'm gonna slowly walk back to my desk this that's bam that's a half hour right there that's it's just the easiest way to eat up time is to like give yourself a stupid little goal go to it surround it with some buffer and then slowly get out of it like that's that's this whole that's the yeah, whole that's day. this right <laughs> yeah, so before anyone criticizes thibault shrowen here remember that when you're at your office like he's at his you find ways to chip away at your hours as well totally. with, with zero productivity. One other thing that I'll say, which just p popped back into mind, was mm -hmm. that in one of these, he's like, hey, so this kind of lined up with um, COVID-19, yeah, but it was unintentional. Yeah. He's like, so we're so happy to see you here again for a new installment in the Sunday series. And he says, I'd like to assure you beforehand that this topic was not chosen in a cynical attempt to somehow profit from the pain and loneliness brought on by COVID-19 and it's parentheses necessary social distancing measures. But if you want to read this book with the context of the epidemic in mind, that's of course perfectly fine. In any case, without much further ado, we bring you part three and four of our story together in a jumbo size issue. Look out for the mammoth sized issue later in 2021. 
And then it says first half of 20... Which was actually gone. ended up being 2023, I think. 2023. Well, it's hard to make a book, man. Yeah. What well, that, that's interesting, too, though. Like, I, I guess I hadn't thought about it too much in that frame of mind, but you could see this as a warning against spending too much time alone. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't want to... Again, I don't want to give anything away, but there are other characters here that seem to live in some way, richer experiences, or at least different experiences. Certainly more social. More social, and more, and the, you can see them bouncing off of each other. Like, they're they're bouncing off of each other and challenging each other in ways that he's not challenging himself. Well, and you could see this as, like, if you look at through the COVID lens, like, if we... It, it can create empathy towards people who were really alone during that time, and if they came out of that being kind of weird, you can kind of understand by looking at their interior life through fiction kind of what happens to a person when you're left with your own thoughts and i think for cartoonists especially like there are hazards to this like it can be a cautionary tale to be like don't sit at the desk 24 hours a day without going outside like absolutely you will you will turn into dave sim and everyone will hate you that's right don't spend too much time alone like seriously cartoon is, cartooning is a solitary pursuit you know and that's why you see people crack up we talk about this a lot mm -hmm. go out be social make it a social event that's what i love about all these readings that are cropping up because yeah. it's a party then it's totally. bonding over a shared interest that's what it should be it should be about community we're stronger together etc yeah what and I would, you, and you don't have to be an extrovert to do it. Like there are plenty of cartoonists at these live drawings and readings and stuff where you can tell they might be kind of uncomfortable, right? But they're engaging and everyone's doing it together. And a bunch of uncomfortable people together can form. Community, That's right. Community. Come, you know what? If you come to a thing in New York City and you're not comfortable talking to a bunch of people, come find me or Mike. And we will be your extrovert shield that will help introduce you <laughs> to everybody in the room if that's what you want. And if it's not what you want, that's fine too. We can just chit chat about whatever your favorite comic is off to the or, side. Or just sit and draw quietly. Yeah, we can hang out and draw quietly. Absolutely. Yeah. We give them some good quiet time. So the one last thing that me that you just made me think of was Dostoevsky. Notes from mm. Underground. Right? A man by himself, essentially underground, which is that chthonic word that come back, right? right. Chthonic as pertaining to the underworld. Right, pertaining tell, to the underworld. Tell, I'm not. I didn't look this up. What exactly would your definition of chthonic be? It, it literally means pertaining to the underworld. Okay, cool. Yeah. So when he says the mouse, a chthonic creature, diminutive in stature, mm -hmm. he's saying a small underground, like you know, a creature that lives underground. Right. Which is also funny because he immediately gets mad that they use that word and has to not read the book anymore because he's just like, fuck these intellectuals. Who do they? Who, they're just writing this for each other to try to press at each other. They're alienating every person. Uh, who would open this book and otherwise be interested by using words that only people who already studied this shit would know. And then he gives up on it. Well, and that wasn't even the book he wanted. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> Rick gets his hands on the book he actually wants and is like, whoa, this is probably way too expensive for me. And then he's immediately distracted by like Hannah Montana yeah. magazines. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, these are actually fun. And the guy who gave him the book is like, those are great. You should borrow those. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. So I, the, the ability to go back and forth and reflect like high art and low art or whatever you want to call I don't even use that word, but you know what I'm saying? Like some kind of like really aristocratic approach to art and then a kind of like technological approach or a more commonplace media like Netflix or he mentions Twitter. Like he talks about a lot of the things that are online right now. So mm -hmm. I, I just think the ability to reflect those back and forth and to have like a real conversation with yourself essentially about them and interrogate the forms in such a way is – this is a, this book was a huge undertaking. Like totally. it reaches yeah. really far. Netflix, look at that. Yeah, hell yeah, Nicholas. It oh, reaches man. really See, that's far. What I'm talking about like you're now you're you're I'm making projection to it. Yeah. Hell yeah. So it reaches really far. Like it 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 shoots the moon, and I think he does it. I He's think he nailed it. it. I think he yeah. fucking nailed it. I like, think he nailed it. Uh, there's hundred percent. I've never read anything else like this. Um, people talk about Proust. Fuck Proust. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> boring. <laughs> I'd rather read this any any day. I mean, week. this was ten out of ten. Would read again. You cannot go wrong with this book. I can say, comics people puts their stamp on it for sure. Comics people book club. Go out and get it. Itchy bond. Sweet. All right. Well, that does it for me. You got anything else? I mean, I could I could literally do this all day. We could, I, we could go back and we forth. We should save the other ones for another time. I, I uh, I'm sorry if I was stepping on your toes there. I just get so excited. I, know, I, did, I feel like I did the same thing. Yeah, we're um, both excited. Yeah, it's there's no malice here. We're just we're yeah. just spitballing. I never take it personal. I don't either. All right. Much love. See you next time. Toodles. Toodles. Toodles.